This is Kirsten Nicolason. I'm at Whitman College and I'll be talking about the geothermal gradient today. Uh, some of the figures that you will see are from John Winter's Principles of Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology. So we've talked a little bit about heat flow and in this image you can see both a false color infrared image of the summit dome at Cleveland Volcano. This dome has since uh, been destroyed and exploded uh, in an eruption, but the color there represents the temperature and you can see the fumaroles to the right and in those bright spots. Uh, but if we look in the visible image below, uh, we see basically the solid surface of the dome and steaming. So we can get a good reading of the temperature at the surface, but we'd like to take a look and see how temperature changes with depth in the interior of the Earth. So just to make sure we all have a good understanding of the geothermal gradient, or geotherm for short, this is the profile of increasing temperature as depth increases into the Earth. We're going to look at a cross section of the upper two to 300 kilometers of Earth. This image from Winter's textbook, figure 1.9, shows us two lines. Now, we don't have any units or measurements on the axes, but depth is increasing downward, so the surface is at the top of the blue rectangle, and we're well into the asthenosphere part of the mantle when we're in the beige box. And notice that the geotherm is going to change its slope depending on how the heat is moving through the material. In the lithosphere, we can have adjacent atoms and molecules pass their vibrational or heat energy, um, but the atoms and molecules themselves are not moving. So in the lithosphere, conduction is the way that our temperature changes. Uh, or is the way that our heat flows and our temperature is going to change with a slope that actually creates a really large temperature increase over a rather short distance increase. Uh, we describe the slope of that line mathematically and we would choose a constant that is appropriate for the heat capacity of the uh, lithospheric uh, materials and composition. In contrast, in the asthenosphere, we have convection. Now, the movement is not very quick. The uh, material is rising upward at about the same rate your fingernails grow. So if you were to not trim your fingernails for an entire year, that would be approximately the amount that the mantle would have convected, hotter mantle would have risen, risen at about that, to about that same distance. The boundary layer here describes the area where con convection is no longer the way uh, the heat is flowing and we're switching over to the conductive geotherm. So here, uh, the boundary layer should be very much thinner than it is. So our boundary layer has been exaggerated here, and in fact, it should probably only be about half the thickness of the blue box. Uh, so this transition is basically uh, the transition between the lithospheric plate that can move as a single entity, whereas the asthenosphere is moving separately from the plate. Notice that the convective geotherm in the asthenosphere 
is described as being adiabatic. Adiabatic means that there is no heat loss laterally. The asthenosphere is assumed to have basically an equal heat capacity on either side of the asthenosphere that we're looking at. Our knowledge of the geotherm, of course, is well determined at the surface of the Earth. We also have drilled into uh, the Earth. The Soviet Union drilled into the Kola Peninsula approximately seven kilometers. I think it's deeper now. And you can measure the temperature at each depth. We also have temperatures that have been determined in very deep mines. Uh, for example, in South Africa, uh, the mines go down two kilometers. And so if we look at what this gradient, this geothermal gradient is uh, in various places where we have thick old continental crust or continental shield, we see that the temperature rises 20 to 25 degrees centigrade per kilometer of depth. In a place where we've had a lot of extension and crustal thinning, it allows the mantle to reach more, uh, it allows the mantle to reach shallower depths and come closer to the surface of the earth. We also might have an area where we have a lot of magma passing through the crust locally, uh, such as in a volcanic arc. In those two areas, our geothermal gradient might be much higher and a, a range that is sometimes talked about for the basin and range is 30 to 35 degrees centigrade per kilometer. So the summary of what we've talked about so far from the first chapter, we've talked about the radius of the Earth, our size, uh, the bulk Earth composition, the composition of the crust, and notice here that the chemical elements are arranged in order of greatest abundance first. So for the crustal composition, silicon and then oxygen are our two most abundant chemical elements, and potassium would be our least abundant uh, chemical element. We've talked about the four different types of heat flow. I'd like you to know these for the exam. And we've talked about how um, surface heat flow uh, lines up with where our plate boundaries are, especially our divergent boundaries. Um, the near surface geothermal gradient is a result of conduction of heat through the solid lithosphere. That heat is coming from the mantle and working its way through the lithospheric plate. And it's a really good number to know that the average geothermal gradient in continental crust is about 20 degrees per kilometer.